What's up YouTube? In this video, we're actually gonna document our trip to Las Vegas. You would think that three years of vlogging would ensure that when I do an intro from the airport, it doesn't end up looking like this, where I record in the wrong direction. But uh, alas, uh, we're obviously gonna have to just do this part over again. Uh, anyway, it was for a meetup for DJF's Sessions podcast. He has a community of Patreons and it was a real lot of fun. Uh, I kind of recorded a little bit of the entire thing as well as put in a session. So we kind of document all of that. Uh, and if you get a chance, please go to pokerrags.us to uh, grab some anti-knit uh, poker apparel. All right. What's up YouTube? Saturday evening here in Las Vegas. I'm um, just kind of getting up and getting ready to head out to the Orleans to put in a session. The first of actually playing No Limit. Uh, likely going to be playing either 1-3 or 2-5. It's one of the few places that I see that doesn't have as long a wait list as everywhere else. Last night was a ton of fun. We ended up going bowling. Got some video from that. And then afterwards there was some uh, DJing in the pit, some blackjack, craps. I try to stay away from that stuff. Um, I used to live here a long time ago and I've just kind of seen the death and destruction that comes with playing in the pits. Obviously I do enjoy it from time to time, but for the most part, I try to stick away from it. And that's all for now. We will be leaving tomorrow afternoon, uh, sometime around like five or six. So maybe we'll squeeze in one more session. I did get to play at the Aria uh, the other day where I was playing just some mixed games, 612, some crazy list of games. I have them up here. I'll try to put them in the description below as well. Things I've never seen before. So I've played like things like Bidacy and Bidusi. Um, but there's just all these new Dramaha games, which I had to learn. And then they had different variants, like Zero Dramaha and 49 Dramaha. Uh, just a lot of a lot of games I'd never seen before. And it was a ton of fun to learn. It kind of felt like a kid again, playing board games or something and trying to figure things out on the fly. Uh, I think I oscillated somewhere between up $100 and $200 and then down. I ended up losing like 17 bucks on the day, which is a win, obviously, just kind of hanging out and drinking. Uh, so that's all for now. Uh, and we will see you uh, for the hand history recaps. All right, we are now at the Orleans, about to put in a session. Probably gonna be one, three, or two, five, no limit. I don't think they have any PLO here. I'll try to mix it up. I think a lot of old people who are gonna be knitting it up. So we're either gonna blast off or uh, get a couple of bullets through. All right, on my way into the casino for the second time uh, in a couple of weeks. First time since reopening. Uh, was the last vlog that I'd put out this one. I actually have a couple of variants around. I'm going to check it out. And so we're going to go over the hand histories from Las Vegas. Uh, my intention when I went there was to try and not play too much actual poker. I was going there for the DJF sessions meetup and didn't really want to get into some big games, get myself stuck and kind of ruin the weekend for myself. Um, obviously, I'm still human. And despite uh, playing full time, I, I still don't have the desire when I'm trying to have a good time to go in and get myself stuck a bunch of money and then have that affect my mood. Um, so in, in that regards, I had gone to Aria, uh, looked at a couple of PLO games. They didn't look very good. And so I think that was even more of a reason not to play serious poker and noticed that there was a 612 limit mixed game running, uh, which is something that I used to play in Las Vegas from time to time to blow off steam and have fun. Uh, actually, a lot of the crazy towers, if you've ever been following me for a while that I've posted on Instagram, are from these mixed games in Las Vegas. Uh, generally, I and some friends would kind of meet up, play these mixed games, build crazy towers, and uh, just have fun drinking, you know, playing limit, small limit, uh, and games that, you know, many of us weren't that particularly good at, and, uh, you know, just firing off. And so when I saw this, I was excited. I was like, wow, I haven't played mix in a long time. Let me check out the mix. They had a big fat stack of plaques, and when I grabbed the plaques, I was kind of blown away by what I'd seen. I have a list that I'm gonna post up in the corner of all the games that were in there, many of which I had never even seen or heard of before. Things like 49 Dramaha, Zero Dramaha, High Doogie, 
uh, things that just sounded like they were mixes of games that I had previously played, but with new alternatives. Uh, for example, the Zero Drama Hall is just Drama Hall with a little bit of a twist. Uh, in Drama Hall, you get five cards. It's a split pot game, half of which goes to the uh, best high Omaha hands. Uh, it is played as Omaha, except you do get to discard once post flop. And the other half goes to, in the case of Zero Drama Hall, the hand that has a closest to zero point value. In 49 Drama Hall, it's the closest to a 49 point value. Picture cards are worth zero, aces are worth one, twos, twos, threes, threes, fours, fours, and so on. Tens are worth 10. And so in Zero Drama Hall, uh, obviously the best possible hand would be a, car, a hand that has all picture cards, because then you have zero. And so essentially you'd be a lock to at least scoop or chop the pot. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting game in that, like, for example, in Zero Drama Ha, if you have a, a handful of paint, then you probably got a lock on half the pot. And now if your whole hand is paint, let's say it's a hand like King, King, Queen, Queen, Jack, well, now you're going to have an actual good Omaha high hand. Uh, so you can obviously play it in a manner in which you're going to have a good one-way hand, uh, or you, you obviously want to have a good two-way hand. The one thing that I'd realized when playing this was that oftentimes pots were just getting chopped a lot, especially if it wasn't more than heads up. Uh, and so it's a game that though fun isn't particularly profitable if a you're playing in small stakes where the uh, Rake is eating up the, the the profit and B if you know most of the pots are chopped then uh, you know No one's really winning uh, So and though I didn't enjoy myself and I was having fun I think I oscillated between like up a hundred down a hundred uh, I ended up losing like 17 bucks uh, Somebody in the community had half my action and so you know I pretty much broke even, uh, had a few drinks, and, and had a good time. You know, is it something that I think could be played for profit at these small stakes? Yeah, I guess if there's enough bad players. Um, anyway, there was really just one hand of note that I, you know, I had a great time playing. Uh, one of the games that I am particularly familiar with is Badesi, which is a mix of ace to five triple draw and Badugi. Uh, so you're trying to make uh, a wheel, uh, ace, two, three, four, five would be the nuts. And then the other half of the pot goes to the best Badoogie. So in this case, it would be, you know, ace, two, three, four, rainbow. So in one of the particular hands, uh, you know, I get dealt the first five cards. I look down and I have ace, two, three, four, rainbow. So I already have the nuts for uh, one side of the pot, which is obviously a dream. And now I'm going to have three draws, uh, one card draws, obviously, to try to get uh, as low as a card as possible. That doesn't pair me. So I'm going to obviously want a five to make the nuts. You know, or a six or a seven to have a very good hand, in which case I'd have like a six low or a seven low and the nut badoogie, uh, which would be the four card rainbow hand. So uh, anyway, you know, betting proceeds. There is a raise. I re-raise. Someone caps. We go cap to the first draw. I draw one. Once I draw one, I think it's fairly obvious that uh, I have a very good at least one way hand. It could be a situation where, you know, if I have ace, two, three, four with uh, three rainbow, I'm obviously going to just try to bink the perfect card to, uh, you know, have like a five low and then hope that the, the, the fifth card is going to be the, the rainbow card to make me a two way hand. But if not, you know, I'm going to try to make a good one way hand. People don't really know that I necessarily have to have all four cards rainbow already. Uh, so uh, at any opportunity, I was trying to raise. I think on the first draw, I bet and just get called. On the second draw, someone raises, I re-raise, they call. And then on the final draw, uh, I get led into, I believe anyway, if my memory serves correctly. Uh, and I end up raising without even looking at my fifth card because obviously, uh, at worst, I should be chopping if someone miraculously has ace, two, three, four, rainbow as well. And I'm essentially free rolling for the other half of the pot. So I raise, they call, I table my four cards, and then I peel the fifth card and oh yeah, on the final draw, we drill the five to make the nut nut uh, and scoop this pot, which I think probably was maybe like 100, 150 bucks. So that was like one my, my one fun hand of note. I think what makes these triple draw games really fun is that unlike, you know, Hold'em or Omaha, where there is a flop, in this case, you're drawing, all your cards are your own. You get to kind of peel them as opposed to if the dealer is putting out the flop, right? You're not really peeling anything. So here uh, you get to kind of look at the edge of the card, see how many pips are on it. Uh, and, and so forth. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, another hand I had induced a seven, I think induced a seven triple draw, but uh, it was actually uh, Badusi, which again is the same concept, but uh, half the pot goes to the best Badugi and the other half to the best triple draw hand. I ended up uh, making on the first draw, the uh, the wheel induced seven triple draw, two, three, four, five, seven, but I only had uh, three rainbow cards. My other two uh, matched the other suits. So I think we ended up going three way for the most part, but ended up chopping against a guy who had like a better three low. And so kind of a case in point again, where, you know, I have the, the nuts for one side of the pot, but because it's just gonna end up getting chopped so often, you don't really make much money uh, unless it's, you know, three or four handed, which 
you know, if people are playing okay, it's not very often that you're going like four or five handed for every single draw. Uh, so like I said, I ended up booking a uh, small loser in that, had a great time. Uh, some other people in the community had been playing PLO. Uh, they did well, they had a good time, but like I said, I, I wasn't interested too much in playing anything too serious. Now obviously because this is a poker vlog, I did want to try to get in a session of some No Limit for the vlog. I contacted my buddy uh, Jeff, who's been, uh, who I've known ever since I used to live in Vegas. Uh, he's a regular like 2-5 player around town and asked him you know, if he wanted to meet up and, and put in a game. Uh, and so we were trying to find a place that wouldn't have too crazy of a wait list because at this time, since not all casinos are open, Vegas is kind of slammed actually. Uh, so we ended up looking around. Aria had some long lists. He lives near the Red Rock. He had said that was a long list. Uh, so we decided to go to the Orleans, which uh, had open seating uh, in 1 3 and a short list for their 2 5 games. So we headed over there, and uh, as, uh, as I had shown, uh, jumped into the 1 3 game first. That was probably what I should have stayed in. Both of us, you know, came there to obviously play a little bit bigger, but once we went to 2-5, that game was kind of dry. So most of the hand histories are from the 1-3. Uh, so let's jump into those hand histories. In the first hand uh, of note, there is a limp under the gun. It folds to me on the button. I have ace-5 of spades. Obviously, I'm going to be raising to isolate. This is a hand that I want to play. And if I'm going to play it, I want to be raising, uh, especially in small games where uh, the rake is going to be a big percentage of the pots. You don't want to be playing a lot of limp pots because the... Uh, the rake is really going to be eating into your profits. Uh, so I make it 15, and he ends up being the only caller. We go heads up to a flop, which comes king, nine, seven with two diamonds. He checks. Obviously, this is a flop that I have no piece of, but I do have the betting lead, and as we mentioned before, we want to maintain our aggression. I bet 21 into about the $30 pot after the rake is taken out. And at this point, he thinks for a bit, looks at his cards, uh, thinks again, and shakily goes to call. Uh, based on his mannerisms, I kind of just get this read that he's not particularly strong and doesn't really know what he wants to do. Uh, obviously, this could be the opposite, that he has a really strong hand and doesn't really know what to do. Uh, but my read is that he doesn't, you know, a lot of times people are just going to raise if they, if they have a great hand. Uh, so he calls and we go heads up to the turn, which is an offsuit four. Once again, he checks and he has about 160 left. Uh, I decided to bet 50 with the plan of blasting off on nine di non-diamond rivers. And I actually might end up uh, just shipping all in on diamond river if I get the read that, again, he doesn't have a flush. Uh, just based on, you know, the speed at which he checks and his mannerisms uh, if he does check to me. Obviously, if he jams a diamond river, I'm going to have to fold with just ace high. Um, anyway, so I bet 50. And again, he kind of shakily thinks for a bit and jams all in for 110 more. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Bad read, obviously, on my part. Uh, obviously, as a you know, a strong hand, I just have ace high. There's nothing I can do but fold. I think for a bit, you know, I, I, I have no idea how long I'm going to be in this game, so I don't want to just instantly fold and make it look like that I'm bluffing, that I you know don't have anything. We want to try to maintain the fact that we're not just bet by bet betting with nothing. Uh, so I think for a bit and fold, and that's when he proudly shows me just a seven for what would be bottom pair. Uh, I think that's obviously very funny because I think it's very unlikely that he just has bottom pair and that he's like you know turning his hand into a bluff. Uh, I think if anything, it's way more likely that he has pocket sevens for flopping bottom set. Uh, so obviously we lose that hand, uh, and now we're stuck like, what, what is it? Something like 85 bucks. Now, once again, he limps. There's another limper. I'm in the small blind with six, seven of spades. I'm going to be isolating here. Uh, probably way too spewy, but again, I said, you know, if I have playable hands, I'm going to be wanting playing raised pots and, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to make hands. So if, you know, if he doesn't flop like top pair or bottom set, like it looks like he did last hand, then it's going to be hard for them to continue. So I make it 25 and he ends up being the only caller. We go heads up to a flop, which comes ace, king, four. Uh, I bet 30 and he folds pretty quickly. I think if he calls this flop, I'm just going to shut it down. Uh, if he's going to be calling this particular flop, it's, I think it's very likely that he has an ace-x hand that he just isn't going to be folding. Uh, it's possible he has some king-x hands, but I think if he calls this exact flop, I'm just going to shut it down unless I pick up some equity, like if it's going to be, you know, the five for an open ender, or if I pick up the backdoor flush draw. Um, obviously, we end up scooping this one, and just a sign of, you know, I, I, I lost in the last hand a situation where, you know, I, I lost $80, but here I am quickly just picking off uh, another like 30 bucks where I get like almost half of it back by just being aggressive. So, you know, if you're going to be playing pots, uh, a bunch of people who are, are, are generally going to be weak passive, uh, it's a spot where you can just kind of blast off until they either show aggression uh, or you get the read that, you know, they're calling strong. A couple of hands later, I pick up the queen jack uh, in late position and open to 13. 
Uh, it's obviously looking like I'm being pretty spewy. I think I've raised like four out of the last like seven or eight hands, um, but generally I'm just kind of playing my hands. Uh, what ends up being interesting is later on when I move to 2-5, I don't play a hand for like a couple of orbits just because, you know, everything ends up being unplayable. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, if you think someone looks like they're being spewy or overactive, it might just be a function of the hands they're getting dealt. Uh, so I open to 13, and now the player to my left jams all in for 35, folds back to me. I think the minimum buy-in is 100, so I'm not even sure. And he looks like he just sat down, so I don't know why he's short. Maybe he lost a hand that I didn't notice. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, for uh, $22 more into this pot, I'm just not going to be folding. Uh, you know, if he has, uh, you know, kings are better or queens are better, and I'm in, like, a well, super bad shape, it's not that big a deal. It's only, like, $20. So I call, uh, and we end up flopping, I think, a queen or a jack and hold against ace-king. Uh, and obviously, at this point, you know, when my hand gets flipped up, it's, it's looking like I'm probably being fairly active. I think to someone that's watching, they might just be like, oh my gosh, this guy called an all-in with like Queen Jack without really realizing that uh, in this instance, I'm getting like better than two to one and there's just not that many hands that I'm a two to one dog against. Now, a, a little bit later, there is a, an under the, gun lump, uh, under the gun limp, under the gun one limps, who's the player that showed me the seven. I'm now on the button with Ace Jack off. The under the gun limp is kind of concerning, but at the same time, I'm not just gonna be limping. I'm gonna raise, see kind of where I'm at as far as based on his actions. So I make it 20. The small blind calls, who's the guy that I just stacked with the queen jack, the big blind calls, and both limpers do call. We go five ways to a flop, which comes jack five three with two spades. They all check to me. Uh, obviously, I, I raise have the best hand here, barring somebody flopping uh, a set, but there are gonna be some combos of worse jacks, as well as flush draws, so we, we do wanna be betting. I'm betting for value. I don't think we want to bet too large because we, we are trying to get called by some weaker hands like Jack 10 or something like that. So I bet 65 into 100. The small blind, who is the player that I just stacked with the Queen Jack, I think it reloaded for 100. Uh, goes all in for just about the same bet, maybe slightly less. Uh, I don't remember exactly. Everybody else folds. Um, and the run ends up coming an offsuit 10 and an offsuit 7 so the flush doesn't get there I, on the flop I immediately show my hand he never ends up showing his hand so I assume we were either up against a flush draw or the worst jack so we hold there uh, and now I think we're up like maybe 100 bucks shortly after that hand the uh, seat opens in the uh, the 2 5 game so obviously our intention was to go play a little bit larger uh, I then go to take my seat in that game looking around the table it actually just looks like a bunch of grinders uh, it is daytime I think it's like one o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon uh, and truth be told, I ended up not playing many hands in this game at all. I think I played it for maybe an hour, hour and a half or something like that. The game was not good. Nobody was really playing any hands except the player to my direct right who kept opening to 15. At first, I hadn't really noticed how active he was. And then uh, towards like, you know, 30 minutes in, I noticed he was the only one that was raising any pots and often raising to 15. Uh, so maybe after like 30 minutes of me seeing him raise like every other hand to 15, essentially versus nobody limping, uh, I end up making the button $60 with Queen Jack off and he quickly folds. Uh, that's kind of, you know, the magic of not playing too many hands is that you're easily going to be getting folds from people who are opening often uh, and then facing a 4x raise. So, uh, you know, we pick up that small one and then um, not, too bit, not too long after that, he limps uh, in early position. I have pocket eights and make it $25. He ends up being the only caller. Uh, and as the dealer goes to flop the board, I notice that the window card is the eight of spades. Uh, it's really nice when the first card that you're seeing is immediately your set. Uh, not so nice, obviously, if it's followed like by like the nine, ten suited uh, for you know a hand where now you have a set on some super draw heavy board where someone could have flopped the flush. Anyway, uh, they fan the board and ends up coming king queen eight with two spades. Kind of a dream flop, uh, having bottom set on this uh, draw heavy board. He checks and I'm going to be sizing up. Uh, I think that he's either going to have a draw here or top pair or nothing at all. There's really no point in sizing down because I don't think he's going to be calling with you know some hand like pocket sevens or pocket fives on this type of board. Uh, and so we wanna start trying to funnel in the money as soon as possible. I bet 45 and he calls fairly quickly. The turn, unfortunately, is about one of the worst cards that I could think of. It's the 10 of spades completing the flush and some gut shot straight draws like ace, jack, and jack nine. He now looks at his cards pretty quickly. Uh, this could be a reverse tell, but I think it's way more likely that he's looking to see uh, whether he has a spade in his hand. Uh, now he leads into me for $80. Obviously, we're not going to be folding. I think raising here would be pretty thin. I don't really know what would be attacking except maybe exactly uh, king X with a spade. Uh, for example, like king nine with uh, the nine of spades. Um, or, you know, like ace king with the ace of spades. I think it's unlikely that he's going to have a hand like ace-king with the ace of spades. Uh, so I like to just call, hoping obviously for some brick rivers where like if he leads again, I can call. Uh, so I call and the river comes a brick and now he checks. 
At this point, I think that he's obviously not going to be folding a straight if he has ace jack or jack nine. There was some hand earlier that he showed where he called a gut shot and got there. So I think it's you know within the realm of possibility that he does have these hands. Uh, I like to check it back, uh, you know, kind of trying to pot control. I think that if I were to be betting, it would be to extract value from some you know two pair hands uh, as well as some hands like maybe ace king or king jack. I don't think he's going to have ace king very often. Uh, anyway, I check it back, and he tables King Jack with the Jack of Spades, which makes a ton of sense. On the turn, he obviously picks up the open ender as well as the Jack High Flush Draw, uh, and he has just an overall strong hand in general. Um, you know, looking back on it, not even to be results oriented, I don't really like my check back on the river. I think on the river, I could be betting some size in like a one third to one half pot to try to be getting value from two pair hands. It's very likely that he's going to be having a hand like, let's say, King 10, King Queen, King Jack, Queen 10. Queen Jack, that might be calling some of these small value bet sizings. Uh, we obviously do open ourselves up to a check raise, which could be kind of gross, but just given the way the hand was played, I don't think that he's ever going to have a flush because he did look back at his hand and it's way more likely that when he's doing this, he's trying to find out if he has a spade. And so if he doesn't have a flush, he's just not going to be check raising a straight. And so yeah, maybe we'll, sometimes we'll be value owning ourselves if I you know bet one third pot and he has ace jack or jack nine. Um, but still, you know, I, I like just going for value here. Uh, so I think we probably missed out on maybe like 70 bucks of value, $80 of value. If we bet that size again, I don't see him folding King Jack. Uh, and these are the things that I think are important. These are the things you want to look back at at the end of a session and think about, because obviously, you know, losing out on $80 in, uh, you know, a few hours is going to be a big drastic difference in your hourly. Um, anyway, that ended up being the last interesting hand of note. Brad Owen then met up with uh, Jeff and I, and we decided that we were going to go grab some, uh, some bar food. And uh, we ended up booking, I think, like a $215 win at the Orleans. Um, you know, nothing, nothing crazy, but I uh, just wanted to get in some hand histories while, you know, playing in Vegas. Uh, after that, we ended up not playing any other sessions. So that was essentially all we had for Las Vegas. As I mentioned, we're now here at the casino, going to be putting in a short session. Uh, and then we'll be, uh, you know, trying to get back to some more live hand histories. Uh, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this Las Vegas recap. I had a great time there. Vegas is packed. I felt like it was very safe. Most of the casinos had these plexiglass dividers, some of which are six handed, giving you tons of space. The Orleans was eight handed. So some of the corner seats were a bit more cramped. Um, but everywhere was very busy. I think, you know, live hold'em or rather live poker in general is, is back. Uh, people are back to gambling. And if you can get into some of these games, uh, you know, whatever city you may live in, they tend to be pretty good. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Catch you later. We are fine. We see our sun shining. And all these good times, we know we had something. Don't feel the vibe when we're not floating. Ain't no good time when it's a darkest in. You give me something that I can give you here. Tell me what you're thinking. I need to know your feeling. If you crush on me, you need to know my story. But don't get too close to me, cause I need my fantasy. You give me something that give you here tell me what you're thinking i need to know your feeling if you crush on me you need to know my story but don't get too close to me cause i need my fantasy here i am falling down crashing down and i feel like i don't need you All right, and we end up with Edonk, who's gonna have the uh, last message here. What do you got to say, buddy? Guys, if you think this vlog's good, go check out Johnny Vibes. <laughs>